In this video, I would like to tell you a story of modern alchemy, how one element can change into another, and more specifically, how the theory of quantum tunnelling allowed physicists to understand one of the great mysteries of atomic physics, the alpha particle paradox. So if you fancy a quantum mechanical deep dive into one of the most fascinating stories in physics, stay tuned. Our story begins in 1896 when the French physicist Henri Becquerel, having heard about the recent discovery of X-rays, decided to see if something similar to X-rays is also emitted from fluorescent materials, which were known to glow when exposed to light. Becquerel believed that the phenomenon of fluorescence might be connected to X-rays in some way, and so he had designed an experiment to show this. Becquerel planned to expose a sample of uranium salt crystals to the sun, and then place the crystals, along with the metal object, over an unexposed photographic plate. He proposed that if the developed plate showed the image of the object, then this would suggest that fluorescing salt crystals were actually emitting X-rays. However, on February 26th and 27th, 1896, the Paris sky was covered with heavy clouds and rain was falling intermittently, and so Becquerel was forced to postpone his experiment. He wrapped his uranium salt crystals in a black cloth, along with a photographic plate and a copper Maltese cross, and waited for a sunnier day. Several days later, when Becquerel finally removed the plate from the drawer, to his astonishment, he discovered that a distinct image of the Maltese cross appeared on the plate, although it had never been exposed to sunlight. The only conclusion possible was that the crystals themselves were emitting radiation. And after repeating the experiment several times, Becquerel wrote, I am now convinced that uranium salts produce invisible radiation even when they have been kept in the dark. Whatever was being emitted was a penetrating form of radiation similar to X-rays, but it was emanating all by itself and without external excitation from the atoms in Becquerel's crystal. Becquerel tried to heat up the crystal, cool it down, grind it to a powder, dissolve it in acids and everything else he could think of, but the intensity of the mysterious radiation persistently remained the same. It became clear that this new property of matter had nothing to do with the physical or chemical way in which the atoms were put together, but that it was a property hidden deep inside the atom itself. Slowly, interest began to grow in this newly discovered phenomenon, and in 1898, Marie and Pierre Curie began to study the strange properties of these uranium rays. Having recently coined the term radioactivity to describe this new phenomenon, Marie and her husband started investigating ways of measuring the intensity of the radiation emitted by different radioactive isotopes, and they soon discovered other radioactive elements in the form of polonium, thorium and radium. Then, in 1899, the 28-year-old Ernest Rutherford discovered that there were actually three different kinds of radiation, alpha, beta and gamma radiation. Alpha particles could be stopped by a thin sheet of paper and only had a very short range in air. Rutherford later discovered that alpha particles consisted of two protons and two neutrons bound together. Beta particles were more penetrating than alpha particles and could travel further through the air. They were able to pass through paper but were stopped by a few millimetres of aluminium. It was later discovered that these beta particles are simply fast-moving electrons that had been ejected from inside the nucleus. And finally, gamma rays, they were discovered to be high-frequency electromagnetic radiation. Now, since an alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons, and since alpha particles are ejected from radioactive nuclei, it follows that when a radioactive nucleus emits an alpha particle, it actually changes into a different element. For example, imagine we have some element which we will call element X. Here, the letter A represents the number of protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, and Z refers to the number of protons inside the nucleus. And because the number of protons inside the nucleus defines which element we have, Z is often referred to as the atomic number, whereas A is referred to as the mass number. Now, if this nucleus emits an alpha particle, then the total number of protons and neutrons will reduce by 4, and the number of protons will reduce by 2. And so we can represent this information using the following decay equation. Note that since the number of protons inside the radioactive nucleus has decreased by 2 when the alpha particle is emitted, we now have a new element. In other words, radioactive alpha decay is a form of nuclear alchemy 
with the power to change one element into another. So what about beta decay? Well, let's imagine that we begin with element X again. Then during beta decay, a neutron inside the nucleus changes into a proton and a fast moving electron which is ejected out of the nucleus. In this case, the mass number stays the same, but now we have one more proton inside the nucleus, and so we see that we get a new element, this time with atomic number Z plus 1. Note that there is actually another particle involved in this process, known as an anti-electron neutrino, which is a neutral particle responsible for carrying away some of the energy of the radioactive decay. I'll have more to say about this particle in an upcoming video. And finally, we have gamma radiation. Now, since gamma radiation is simply high-frequency electromagnetic radiation, and since electromagnetic radiation is both massless and chargeless, the decay equation for gamma decay is not particularly interesting or illuminating, but I've included it for completeness. And so there we have it, three types of radiation, all emitted from inside the nucleus. And our task in the remainder of this video is to focus on alpha radiation and try to understand how quantum mechanics came to the rescue to provide a solution to a long-standing paradox known as the alpha particle paradox. So what was this paradox and how was it solved? Let's get started. To understand the paradox, we need to understand the work of Ernest Rutherford in 1910. Rutherford was performing a series of experiments which involved firing alpha particles that had been emitted by the radioactive isotope polonium-212 towards a sample of uranium-238. Rutherford was able to show that the interaction between the alpha particles and the uranium nuclei followed the Coulomb law of electrostatic repulsion that would be expected to operate between two positively charged spherical objects. According to Coulomb's law, if two charged objects Q1 and Q2 are separated by a distance r, then the electrostatic potential energy due to these two objects is given by the following expression, where epsilon naught equals 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 is a constant known as the permittivity of free space. By studying the scattering angles of the alpha particles as they pass near to the uranium nuclei, Rutherford was able to conclude that for a uranium-238 nucleus, the potential energy function felt by a neighbouring alpha particle would follow Coulomb's law. Now, when an alpha particle is fired directly at the uranium nucleus, it will slow down as it approaches due to the electrostatic repulsion. It will momentarily stop at its closest approach and then be repelled back in the direction it came from. As the alpha particle approaches the nucleus, its kinetic energy is converted into electrical potential energy and at the point of closest approach when the alpha particle is momentarily stationary, all of the initial kinetic energy of the alpha particle has been converted into electrical potential energy and therefore we can use the conservation of energy along with Coulomb's law to actually calculate the distance of closest approach. Now, in the experiment that Rutherford was conducting, he was using alpha particles emitted from the radioactive isotope polonium-212, which had a kinetic energy of 8.78 megaelectron volts, where, if you recall, a megaelectron volt is simply an alternative unit for energy which is often used by particle physicists. To be precise, one megaelectron volt is equivalent to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. Now, as already mentioned, at the distance of closest approach, all of this kinetic energy would have been converted into potential energy, and so we can use Coulomb's law to write the following expression. Now, the charge of the uranium nucleus is equal to 92 times E, where E is the fundamental unit of charge, and the charge of the alpha particle is equal to 2 times E. If we then rearrange for the radius, we find the following yellow expression, and then if we sub in all the values, we find that the distance of closest approach is 3 times 10 to the minus 14 metres. And so Rutherford was able to conclude from his alpha scattering experiments that the potential energy equation describing the interaction of the alpha particle and uranium nucleus obeys Coulomb's law for separations greater than the distance of closest approach of around 3 times 10 to the minus 14 metres. And so if we plot a graph of particle separation on the x-axis and potential energy on the y-axis, we find the following smooth curve which represents a 1 over r relationship in line with Coulomb's potential energy equation. But what about smaller separations? Well, 
It was generally believed that Coulomb's law applied until the separation between the alpha particle and the uranium nucleus became comparable to the radius of the uranium nucleus. And then beyond this, it was expected that the 1 over R relationship no longer held. But exactly what form does the potential energy curve take for separations smaller than the nuclear radius? Well, a clue to answering this question could be found in the fact that uranium-238 nuclei occasionally emit alpha particles, and therefore it was assumed that alpha particles must exist inside such nuclei prior to being emitted, and therefore for separations less than the nuclear radius of uranium, the alpha particles can be thought of as being bound to the nucleus by an attractive negative potential, as represented by the dashed green line on the graph. And so, after piecing the available evidence together, it was believed that the potential energy function describing the interaction of an alpha particle and the uranium nucleus must take the following form. This conclusion was later verified by experiments involving the scattering of particles produced by cyclotrons at high energies, high enough to investigate the potential energy over the entire range of distances. OK, so far so good. But what exactly is the problem? What is this alpha particle paradox that I keep banging on about? Well, as we've already mentioned, uranium-238 nuclei also emit alpha particles, and it had been established through careful experimentation that the kinetic energy of the emitted alpha particles was always 4.2 mega electron volts. Now, this kinetic energy was measured when the alpha particle was a large distance away from the uranium nucleus, where the potential energy is negligible. And therefore, this 4.2 mega electron volt energy represented the total energy of the emitted alpha particle. Now, if you look at the red line drawn on the graph, then hopefully you can immediately see the problem. An alpha particle of total energy 4.2 mega electron volts is initially bound inside the nucleus. And we see from the graph that this region is separated from the rest of space by a potential barrier significantly greater than 4.2 mega electron volts. And yet, somehow, alpha particles seem to be penetrating through this barrier during the radioactive decay of uranium. So how is this possible? From a classical physics perspective, it's as if a ball is rolling along a smooth path towards a hill with less than half the kinetic energy needed to reach the top and roll down the other side, and yet sometimes we find it on the other side of the hill. According to classical physics, this is simply not possible. So what's going on, and how can this paradox be resolved? Well, as is true for many problems in physics, the answer lies in quantum mechanics. In 1928, Gamow, Condon and Gurney provided a solution to the problem by treating alpha particle emission as a quantum mechanical barrier penetration problem. And in the remainder of this video, I'm going to outline their approach and show how one of the most esoteric properties of quantum mechanics, aptly named quantum tunneling, can help explain alpha particle emission. To begin with, we need to wrap our heads around this phenomenon of quantum tunneling. So let's imagine a particle of mass m moving along the positive x-axis with kinetic energy E towards a potential barrier of height V0 and width A, as shown in the diagram. Furthermore, we will assume that the kinetic energy of the particle is less than the height of the potential barrier, so that E is less than V0. We can represent this potential barrier mathematically by defining the potential in three regions as follows. In region 1, we have that the potential is equal to 0, in region 2, we have that the potential is equal to V0, and in region 3, again, we have that the potential is equal to 0. Now, according to classical physics, if the energy of the particle incident upon the potential barrier is less than the height of the potential barrier, V0, then the particle will simply be reflected with probability equal to 1 when it encounters the barrier. According to classical physics, there is absolutely no way for the particle to pass through the barrier if its energy is less than the height of the potential barrier. However, according to quantum mechanics, the situation is quite different. In particular, we will see that even if E is less than V0, then quantum mechanics predicts that there is a certain calculable probability that the particle will be transmitted through the potential barrier and out the other side. In order to show how this works in detail, let us consider each of the three regions 1, 2 and 3 in turn. 
Since we're now dealing with a quantum mechanical approach, our strategy will be to solve the Schrodinger equation in each of these regions and then look at how the solutions provide us with information about the behaviour of the particle in each of those three regions. If you're unfamiliar with the basics of quantum mechanics, then I strongly suggest pausing the video at this stage and watching my other video on the Schrodinger equation. However, even if you are unfamiliar with the basics, you should still be able to follow the general narrative in what follows. We will begin by considering the region to the left of the barrier where the potential energy is zero. In this region, the particle can be described as a free particle and correspondingly we need to solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation, where we have labelled the eigenfunction psi1 to make it clear we are dealing with region 1 of the diagram. The solutions of the time-independent Schrodinger equation provide us with the eigenfunctions psi1, which then allow us to construct the full wave function by multiplying by the standard exponential phase factor where the eigenvalues E are equal to the total energy of the particle. Now, in our example, because the potential energy is zero in the first region, we can set V of X equal to zero, in which case the time-independent Schrodinger equation simplifies. And we can then rearrange this to write it in an equivalent form. So, how do we solve this equation? Well, we begin by considering a trial solution of the following form. We can then check that this is indeed a solution by subbing it back into the time-independent Schrodinger equation. If we then differentiate once with respect to x, we find the following expression. And if we differentiate twice with respect to x, we find the following yellow expression. If we then compare this with what we had before, we see that our trial expression for psi of x is indeed a solution, provided that k squared equals 2me over h bar squared. In other words, we require that k equals the square root of 2me divided by h-bar. Now, when the e to the ikx term appearing in the eigenfunction is combined with the e to the minus iet over h-bar term to form the full wave function, this term can be thought of as representing a travelling wave propagating in the direction of increasing x. And therefore, this term can be thought of as describing a particle moving in the direction of increasing x. And when the second term, involving e to the minus ikx, is combined with e to the minus iet over h-bar, it represents a travelling wave, and therefore particle, propagating in the direction of decreasing x. This suggests that we should associate the first term with the incident particle moving towards the potential barrier, and the second term with the reflection of that particle with the potential barrier. We can use this association to calculate the probability that the incident particle is reflected, which we call the reflection coefficient. The reflection coefficient depends on the ratio b over a, which specifies the amplitude of the reflected part of the wave function relative to the amplitude of the incident part. But in quantum mechanics, probabilities do not depend on amplitudes, but rather on the modulus squared of the amplitudes, and thus we can write the reflection coefficient as the modulus of b squared divided by the modulus of a squared. That is, the reflection coefficient is equal to the ratio of the intensity of the part of the wave that describes the reflected particle to the intensity of the part that describes the incident particle. Now, if we go back to our original diagram, we see that in region 3, the potential is also equal to zero. And so in this region, our time-independent Schrodinger equation takes the following form, where we've labelled the eigenfunction psi 3 to make it clear we're dealing with region 3 of the diagram. As before, the general solution to this equation takes the following form, where the constants c and d are to be distinguished from the constants a and b that appeared in our previous expression. Now, given that we're considering a particle that is incident upon the potential barrier from the left, it follows that if the particle manages to tunnel through the barrier, then in the region to the right of the barrier, the particle should be described by a wave travelling to the right in the direction of the original wave. Furthermore, since there is nothing to the right of the barrier that could reflect this wave, we can set d equals to zero in our eigenfunction expression. And so, we see that to the right of the potential barrier, our eigenfunction takes the following compact form. OK, but what about region 2? How do we solve the Schrodinger equation for the region containing the potential barrier itself? Well, in this region, the potential is non-zero and takes the constant value v naught, and therefore the time-independent Schrodinger equation 
takes the following form, where we've labelled the eigenfunction psi2 to make it clear we're dealing with region 2 of the diagram. And if we rearrange this expression, we can write it equivalently in the following form. Now, the general solution to this equation has the following form, and unlike the eigenfunctions either side of the barrier, here psi of x is not a complex function and does not contain the imaginary number i. Now, we can check that this is indeed a solution of the time-independent Schrodinger equation by differentiating it. If we differentiate once with respect to x, we find the following equation. And if we differentiate again with respect to x, we find the following purple expression. And if we then compare this with what we had before, we see that psi of x is indeed a solution, provided that beta takes the following form. And so to summarise, we have the following eigenfunction expressions corresponding to each of the three regions. Now, our task is to determine an expression for the tunnelling probability, which tells us the likelihood that a particle incident upon the barrier from the left will tunnel through the barrier and appear on the right. Since the term involving the coefficient a can be thought of as representing the incoming particle, and the term involving the coefficient c can be thought of as representing the particle that has successfully passed through the barrier and is now moving in the direction of increasing x on the right-hand side, the terms a and c can be thought of as the amplitudes of the corresponding waves, and therefore our tunnelling probability can be constructed as the ratio of the intensity of the transmitted wave and the incoming wave. In other words, our tunnelling probability will take the following form. And so our objective is to now use the eigenfunction solutions in each region to construct an explicit expression for the tunnelling probability. So let's do that. Now, the first step towards achieving this goal is to use the fact that in order for our eigenfunctions to be acceptable solutions to the Schrodinger equation, we require that an eigenfunction and its derivative are finite, single-valued and continuous. These requirements are imposed to ensure that the eigenfunctions are mathematically well-behaved functions, and therefore the measurable quantities that can be determined from these eigenfunctions will also be suitably well-behaved. So what exactly does this mean? Well, in our specific example, we require that psi of x and d psi by dx should match up at the edges of the barrier. So let's see how this works in detail. Let's begin by looking at the boundary between region 1 and region 2. It then follows that continuity of the wave function at the left-hand edge of the barrier, where x equals 0, requires that psi 1 of 0 equals psi 2 of 0. And if we sub in the explicit expressions for the eigenfunctions, we find that psi 1 of 0 equals a plus b and psi 2 of 0 equals f plus g. And so the constraint psi 1 of 0 equals psi 2 of 0 becomes simply a plus b equals f plus g. Next, continuity of the derivatives of the wave function at x equals 0 requires the following constraint to be true. And if we sub in the eigenfunctions, we find the following two expressions. And so we see that the continuity constraint of the derivatives at x equals 0 translates into the statement that ika minus ikb equals minus b to f plus b to g. Next, if we consider continuity of the wave function at x equals a, we find the following two expressions for psi 2 of a and psi 3 of a, and therefore continuity of the wave function at x equals a requires the following constraint to be true. And finally, if we consider continuity of the derivatives of the wave function at x equals a, we find the following two yellow equations. And so in this case, continuity of the derivative at x equals a requires the following condition to be true. Next, we shall express the constants a and c in terms of f. We begin by combining the two continuity constraints at x equals 0 to write the following purple expression. Then, if we carefully combine the two continuity constraints at x equals a, we can write two expressions, one relating c and f and the other relating g and f. Now, in principle, we have all the pieces necessary to calculate the tunnelling probability. However, to avoid algebraic tedium and to simplify matters considerably, we will first assume that our potential barrier is a wide barrier. In other words, the product of the barrier width parameter a and the energy parameter beta 
are sufficiently large that the exponential term e to the minus 2 beta a is going to be much less than 1. In this case, we see from the relationship between g and f that if e to the minus 2 beta a is much less than 1, then g is much less than f. And therefore, in our other constraint equation involving a, f and g, the f term will dominate the g term. And so we can approximate this expression by ignoring the g term and writing it as 2 i k a is approximately equal to minus beta minus i k times f. If we then rearrange this expression for f, we find the following expression. And if we then sub this into the constraint equation relating c and f, we find the following blue equation. And then by rearranging this expression for c over a, we obtain the following yellow equation. And if we then form the complex conjugate of this expression by replacing the i's with minus i's, we find the following green expression. And so finally, we're in a position to write down an explicit expression for the tunnelling probability. We simply need to multiply our previous two expressions together, in which case we find the following compact expression for the tunnelling probability, where k and beta are defined by the expressions that we derived earlier. If we then sub the explicit form for k and beta into our equation for the tunnelling probability, we find the following expression, which is now written in terms of the step height, v0, and the energy of the incoming particle, e. Now, it's worth noting that the factor inside the square brackets multiplying e to the minus 2 beta a is typically of order unity, and therefore the exponential term typically dominates the overall calculated probability. And therefore the prefactor is often dropped, and the tunnelling probability is often written simply as t is equal to e to the minus 2 beta a. And this is the equation that we will use in what follows. So let's just pause a moment and take stock of where we are. We have found an expression for the tunnelling probability for a particle of energy E to pass through a rectangular potential barrier of height V0 and width A in the case where the energy of the particle is less than the height of the potential barrier. Now, if we were to plot the probability density for each of the three regions, which is simply equal to the modulus squared of the wave function, we would find a curve like the one shown in the diagram. This curve tells us information about where it's most likely to find our particle. And so we can see that since the probability density curve is non-zero on the right-hand side of the barrier, there is a finite probability that a particle incident on the potential barrier will be found on the right-hand side. And furthermore, the probability that this will happen can be estimated using the tunnelling probability equation that we have derived. Now, from the point of view of classical mechanics, the result that we've derived is pretty remarkable. Our equation is saying that a particle of mass m and total energy E incident on a potential barrier of height v0 greater than E and finite thickness A actually has a finite probability of penetrating the barrier and appearing on the other side. This phenomenon is known as quantum tunnelling or barrier penetration and the particle is said to tunnel through the barrier. What we now want to do is use our newfound knowledge of quantum tunnelling to address the alpha particle paradox that we encountered earlier. To do this, we're going to look at the example of alpha emission by the radioactive isotope polonium-212, which decays into lead-208 through the emission of an 8.78 megaelectron volt alpha particle. Experimental observations show that polonium-212 has a half-life of 0.3 microseconds. Now, if you recall, the half-life of a radioactive isotope is the time taken for half of the radioactive nuclei within a radioactive sample to decay. Our objective is to model the emission of alpha particles from polonium-212 using the theory of quantum tunnelling, and hopefully we should be able to theoretically determine the half-life of polonium-212 and compare it with the experimentally determined value. So let's do that. To begin with, we will use a simplified model in which we represent the potential barrier experienced by the alpha particle as a rectangular barrier, since we've already shown how to calculate the tunnelling probability for this situation. In our simplified model, we will assume that the nuclear influence over the alpha particle stops abruptly 
at the point where the polonium nucleus and the emitted alpha particle are just touching each other. This assumption will then allow us to calculate where the potential barrier begins, as well as the height of the rectangular barrier. To find where the potential barrier begins, we simply need to calculate the radius of the polonium nucleus and the radius of the alpha particle and then add these two values together. To do this, we can use the well-known empirical nuclear radius equation that relates the mass number of a nucleus with its radius. In this expression, A represents the mass number and R0 is an empirically determined constant which takes the value 1.2 femtometers. When the polonium nucleus emits an alpha particle, its mass number will reduce by 4, and so we must make sure that we use the reduced mass value of 208 when calculating the radius. It then follows that the distance separating the alpha particle and nucleus when they're just touching is given by the following expression, which evaluates to 9.01 femtometers, which we can then add to our diagram. We can then calculate the height of the barrier by calculating the Coulomb potential energy when the separation is 9.01 femtometers. If we sub in the values of the constants, we find an energy of 4.19 times 10 to the minus 12 joules, which is equivalent to 26.2 mega electron volts. OK, so this is how high the barrier is. But how do we determine the width of the barrier? Well, to do this, we simply need to calculate the separation distance at which the Coulomb potential drops to the observed energy level of the emitted alpha particle, which, as we've already mentioned, has an experimentally determined value of 8.78 mega electron volts. In order to calculate the separation R corresponding to this energy, we simply rearrange the Coulomb potential energy equation for R, and if we sub in the numbers, we find an answer of 26.9 femtometers, and therefore the width of our potential barrier will be equal to 26.9 minus 9.01, which rounds to 17.9 femtometers. We now have all the information necessary to calculate the tunnelling probability. Firstly, we can calculate beta using the fact that E equals 8.78 mega electron volts and V naught equals 26.2 mega electron volts, in which case we can see that beta is equal to 1.83 times 10 to the 15, and therefore if we sub in A equals 17.9 femtometers, we find that the tunneling probability is equal to 3.69 times 10 to the minus 29. And this incredibly small number tells us the probability that an alpha particle hitting the potential barrier will tunnel through it and pass out the other side. Now, in addition to the tunneling probability we've just calculated, the alpha emission rate also depends on how many times the alpha particle inside the nucleus hits against the potential barrier each second. To calculate this frequency, we can imagine the alpha particle moving back and forth inside the nucleus with an energy equal to 8.78 mega electron volts, colliding with the potential barrier on either side of the nucleus. We can estimate the velocity of the alpha particle by rearranging the kinetic energy equation so that we have an expression for the velocity v. If we then sub in the numbers, we find that the alpha particle velocity can be approximated to be 2.06 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. It then follows that the frequency with which the alpha particle hits against the potential barrier is equal to the velocity of the alpha particle divided by the distance between the barriers either side of the nucleus, which is simply equal to V over 2R. And if we then sub in the values, we find a frequency of collision of 1.14 times 10 to the 21 collisions per second. And therefore, for a given alpha particle, the probability per second for emission is given by the product of the collision frequency with the tunnelling probability. And if we sub in the numbers, we find a value of 4.2 times 10 to the minus 8. This number that we've just calculated is referred to as the decay constant. And knowledge of this number allows us to finally be able to calculate the theoretically predicted half-life of polonium-212 based on our simplified model. So let's do that. In order to calculate the half-life, we will make use of the famous half-life equation, which should be familiar to those of you who studied high school physics. This equation allows you to calculate the half-life of a radioactive isotope if you know the decay constant. And since we do, we can simply plug in the value we've just calculated, and we find a predicted half-life of 1.6 times 10 to the 7 seconds. Now, 
Considering that the experimentally determined value of the half-life of polonium-212 is 0.3 microseconds, or 3 times 10 to the minus 7 seconds, we have not done very well. In fact, our prediction is 14 orders of magnitude different from the experimentally determined value. So what's gone wrong? Well, the obvious answer is that we've used an incredibly crude approximation. Instead of the actual Coulomb potential barrier, we use the rectangular barrier, and clearly this has had a huge effect on our final answer. So can we do better? Well, thankfully, the answer is yes. The expression that we originally derived for the tunnelling probability was for a rectangular barrier of height v0 and width a. To improve on this very crude model, we need a way of approximating the shape of the true Coulomb potential barrier. To do this, we're going to break our Coulomb barrier into five equal width rectangular segments and then multiply the successive tunnelling probabilities for each of these segments. Once again, we will take the full width of our potential barrier to be 17.9 femtometers. But let's now divide this width into five equal sections, each of width 3.58 femtometers. Now, in order to calculate the height of each barrier segment, we will simply calculate the Coulomb potential corresponding to the midpoint of each section. To keep things neat and tidy, let's record the midpoint x position of each segment in a table and mark these values on the graph. If we then calculate the Coulomb potential corresponding to each of these r values, we find the following set of results. And these values represent the heights of the potential barrier for each segment. Next, we can use the tunnelling probability equation to calculate the tunnelling probability for each segment. And if we do this, we find the following set of results. Now, the total probability that an alpha particle will tunnel through all five successive potential barriers is simply equal to the product of the tunnelling probabilities for each segment. And therefore, if we calculate this product, we find the following result. Next, if we use the same collision frequency as before, 1.14 times 10 to the 21, then we find that this time the decay constant is given by the following value. And therefore, Using our improved model, we find that our predicted value for the half-life of polonium-212 is 0.26 microseconds. Now, considering the experimentally determined value is 0.3 microseconds, this is a pretty remarkable result, considering our relatively crude approach, and goes to show how far you can get using well-chosen models in theoretical physics. Now, what this analysis has shown us is that the tunnelling probability is highly sensitive to the potential barrier height and width. So the natural question arises, can we do better still? Well, the obvious answer is yes, of course we can. In our model calculation, we approximated the Coulomb potential barrier using five equal width rectangular barriers. Now, it's clear that if we had used more than five segments, our approximation would have been closer to the true potential barrier, as can be seen from the diagram. Now clearly, if we used an infinite number of infinitesimally thin barriers, then we would approach the answer exactly, and in that case, our tunnelling probability equation would change into an integral expression of the following form, where beta is now a function of position, which depends on the explicit form of the Coulomb potential. And this is precisely the approach adopted by Gamow, Condon and Gurney in 1928, when they provided the first quantum mechanical explanation of the emission of alpha particles. This calculation represented one of the first successful and most convincing applications of Schrödinger's wave equation, and moreover, it laid to rest the alpha particle paradox that had plagued physicists for almost two decades. And that brings us to the end of this short quantum mechanical story. It's remarkable to think that the esoteric properties of quantum tunnelling lie at the heart of radioactive alpha decay, but it's even more remarkable to think that life on Earth would probably not exist if it wasn't for radioactive decay. Because here on Earth, right under your feet, deep underground, our planet is constantly being warmed by the energy released in radioactive decay. And without radioactivity, there would be no seismic or volcanic activity, and the surface of the Earth would have been ice cold billions of years ago, and life as we know it would probably not exist at all. I think it's only appropriate to end with the wise words of Marie Curie who said, Nothing in life is to be feared, it's only to be understood. Life is not easy for any of us, but what of that?
We must have perseverance and above all confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and that this thing must be attained. I hope you enjoyed the video and I wish you every success in uncovering your gift. Thank you.